Hello friends, this is Norbert Tripp again. In a previous video I talked about the buckling of compressed rods. Building on this, I will now give you some information about the maximum loading on truss that is used in a structure as a tower and thus subjected to pressure. In the catalogues of Tomcat, Litec, Milos, Prolite and JTE you can find information about towers and their loading capacities. However, these loading capacity figures are not to be taken as absolute values. What I mean is, the information provided can be understood as a guideline and not necessarily as an absolute maximum. The actual maximum loads may vary depending on number of factors, as each application contains individual defining parameters that affect loading capacity. I will now explain these different factors. First of all, there's the height of the tower or the length of the truss. If the length of the truss increases compared to the technical specification in the catalog, the load capacity may decrease. If, on the other hand, the length is decreased, it is theoretically possible that a higher load can be supported. The length of the tower is a very important element for use in the formula that calculates the critical load. You can see the effect of tower length on these two models. The size of the rods is identical. They just differ in length. When assembling them as a tower, and I put a ball as a weight on top of the short model, nothing happens. It is strong enough to hold it. But when putting it on the long model, it fails due to buckling. Uh, what buckling means, you can see in another video that we made before about buckling, as I said before already. It can be found on our trussing and rigging television channel www.a4i.tv. Equally as important as the tower length is the static system, which defines the buckling coefficient and the resulting buckling length. Depending on how the overall structure is designed, the buckling coefficient also changes. The higher the buckling coefficient, the lower the allowable tower load. Determining the buckling coefficient, therefore, depends on the structure. Let's take a look at a few different types of structures. As an example for the first Euler case, we can use a ground support system which achieves its stabilization exclusively through the use of outriggers on the bases. When the critical load is exceeded, the rig swerves to the side. The outriggers must therefore provide restraint. But usually, the profiles of the outriggers on a commercial base are not big enough to do this job. The long outriggers and bracing diagonals are usually only used to provide a certain amount of stability while lifting the rig. On the other hand, there are systems available where the base and the outriggers have a bending stiffness and strength compared to that of the tower truss. In those cases, the base, including outriggers, can be considered for the tower as restrained. The effect these bases have on the maximum load will be explained later. For now, let's talk about a classic ground support made of towers and a horizontal truss grid that can be lifted by means of sleeve blocks. As soon as the rig is secured at its final height, wind bracings are usually installed. These work like a horizontal support and serve to prevent the upper corners from shifting. Since outriggers on regular bases only contribute to a limited stiffening of the structure, it is advised to consider them as non-existent when doing a calculation. This results in the static system of the second Euler case. The two endpoints cannot shift, but they can rotate. Okay, let's see the described first and second Euler cases on a model of a portal and not on an animation anymore. As there is no stabilizing element, that means no guy wires and no massive outriggers on the bases, the system collapses. Only after I installed the triangles, which can represent massive outriggers, for example, the system becomes 
stable. As soon as I create a vertical load at the head of the towers, the towers move sideways. This corresponds to the first Euler case, where the buckling length is twice the tower height. Okay, let's now change the system from Euler case 1 to case 2 by removing the bottom restraints and adding some guy wires. If I now press down on the head of the towers, they swerve to the side. The buckling length is now only one times the tower's height. In reality, when the tower is built with the usual small base, including outriggers, the stabilizing effect is not considered, which means it behaves like a joint. Consequently, this also means that the stiffening diagonals can be disassembled if necessary, once the wind bracings are mounted. This way, a collision with the stage that could be assembled between the towers can be avoided. During dismantling, however, they must be reinstalled before the wind bracing is dismantled to restore stability. However, if the base and outriggers are really massive, and can absorb the corresponding forces of the tower, they can of course also be taken into account, resulting in the third Euler case. On my model, it looks like this. After adding the restraints on the base, which symbolizes the outriggers, I press again on top of the towers. You can see a buckling figure that corresponds to Euler case three. The buckling length now is 0.7 times the tower height. You could see that I need to press more hard to make the tower buckle. That shows again that a smaller buckling coefficient results in higher resistance against buckling. The fourth Euler case with the pressed beam restrained at both ends is hardly ever found in event technology, so I won't give an example here. That's for now enough about buckling. What else influences the load capacity of a tower truss? The third point to be considered as is what external loads are acting on the truss. Is there only a compressive force or are there bending loads at the same time? For a ground support system that is used indoors, the tower is normally only loaded by a vertical compressive force due to gravity. For an outdoor stage roof, on the other hand, which is often provided with wall cladding, the truss is also subjected to additional bending stress due to wind loads, as soon the cladding is connected directly to the tower. This massively reduces the maximum allowed compressive force, as the danger of buckling is greatly increased by the bending moment. Using this model again, I can exert a compressive force without any problems. Wait a second, I have to change the system. Okay, now just one simple tower. I can exert a compressive force without any problem. Nothing happens. You can see probably that the spring is getting shorter a little, but as soon I add a horizontal load, an additional bending moment created and the tower buckles. Finally, besides the truss itself, tower components such as the base, the sleeve block or the head section can be also a limiting factor. That means in case the spindle under the base or the profiles of the base or the dead hanging device is weaker than the truss, the maximum loading capacity is of course limited by these items. I hope it's now more understandable why it's difficult to make a definitive claim on the load-bearing capacity of a tower if we take all these factors into account. The assessment, therefore, depends on each individual application. The values given in the catalogues can be understood as guidelines and not as a number carved in stone. If you are unsure about the load-bearing capacity, you should contact us or a qualified structural engineer who you trust. That's it for the moment. Bye-bye.